I want to start by asking you about Bloom's taxonomy and music education, especially for strings. So tell me about Bloom's taxonomy. First of all, I see here that it's remembering, understanding, applying, analyzing, and evaluating that these are the first five parts of the Bloom's taxonomy. And then above that, is there one more? It's creating? Creating, yeah. And so that's the big one we're interested in. So uh, Bloom's taxonomy, it's a categorization system for categorizing levels of thought or levels of complexity of thought. So the most basic level is remembering. Can you recall a fact? What is your name? You can recall that fact. What is the key signature of D major? Can you recall that fact? The next level is to actually understand something, which is to say, can you put something into your own words? So if I name a concept, can you re-describe that concept to me? And that demonstrates a level of understanding. Applying. Can you take the things you know? Can you take the things that you have some understanding of and actually do something with it? We live in the world of instrumental music, we try to live and we live a lot of times in the applying stage, right? So if you're talking about maybe reading music, you see a D note on the staff. Can you recall that that's a D note? Do you understand that you can play a D note, third finger on the A string or open D, or maybe there's a couple of different ways you can play a D note. Can you apply that? So can you perform music that includes a D note? Next step is to analyze something. And if you are playing music in any kind of self-aware way, there's constant analysis, tuning, rhythmic precision, being together with the people around you. There would be pattern recognition. Do you recognize half a scale when you see it? So you're analyzing as you go. You're analyzing the way things fit. You're evaluating all the time. And then all that feeds back into the application. So each one of these levels gets you a little more complicated. But then there's this creating piece, which is the very top mm. of the Bloom's pyramid is generally presented as a pyramid. Can you take the things you understand and can you put those together in a novel way to make something that's new, mm. that's different than what anybody else has done? And this is one of the objectives or the standards that are recommended, right? I think we would probably both agree that this is one of the most elusive things for mm. a lot of classroom string teachers in middle school and high school around the country is how do they get their kids to create? Well, you know, this has been a struggle for me as a music teacher for my whole career. I am a creative musician. The first time I picked up an instrument, partway through the sixth grade, I was already making things up. Played in rock bands. My favorite music I play in the bands that I've been in is the music that we write ourselves. And even as a teacher, my relationship to music is highly creative because I got to figure out how to get these ideas across to kids. But when I get into teaching in the classroom, I've hit a lot of roadblocks in trying to bring creativity to my students the way that I experience creativity. And I'm going to say I have tried and failed repeatedly to establish a creative environment in my classroom. I think we have a musical environment. They Absolutely. call music a creative art, but it, a lot of times it's a recitative art. If all you're doing is reciting, we give recitals. I don't know how creative that is. If you've got your conductor, your teacher telling you, play it like this, play it like that, start here, stop there. There's small it, it, C creative yeah. and then there's like big C creative. Yeah. I mean, it's different to be interpreting classical music. Certainly that's a creative practice, but it's different than writing a song or improvising mm -hmm. on a song. So let me ask you, tell me about the failures. What have you tried? Have you tried different things? Have you tried the same things? Can you right. illustrate what happened? It always boils down to time. And I'll just say that my failures all have boiled down to time in the end. For example, I love writing music, right? So I've tried to encourage kids to write music and we've done composition projects. And there were times where we performed things that kids Let's say compose, like the student would come up with melodies. Sometimes even a counter melody and I would arrange it. But by the time you go through all of the projects, so you assign a project, you got to go through all the papers, you got to grade them all. So it takes a tremendous amount of my time. Then you got to identify the things I like well enough. So then it's the work of putting that out. Now I got to teach it to everybody. The time investment right. in doing that was tremendous. What else have you tried? 
So one of the things that we battle is that we're a performance-based class, which is to say, I take my kids out in public these many times a year, and we play prepared. We're not playing Mozart, but we're playing in a classical sort of thing where all the parts are written. Everybody has their part to play. It has to be together. It has to be in tune. It has to have your dynamics. It has to not be a pile of mess. So this so puts I, a lot so, of pressure on you, and then you feel like you don't have time to, to devote to other things, like creativity. That's it. So I, I'm looking at deadlines. I'm fighting deadlines. Right. And if we don't have these skills down, right. and if we don't have these skills down in a way that is rhythmically accurate, has good intonation, right. that has some level of right. expressiveness right. to it, you know, so, so there's time pressure. And right. you get to a point where you think anything that's not directly going into your repertoire that's up for public presentation, there's pressure. Can that, I ask you yeah. about that? In the last couple of days, when I was with mm -hmm. your school, we did play along style. Just feel free to be honest. But when, you know, I've got a loop going, I'm asking the whole orchestra to play lines back to me. Here's what I heard. I could look around the room and I could tell were the kids playing back the lines or not. Sometimes they all played them back. Sometimes there was a couple that didn't. Sometimes a lot of them missed them. And I could really quickly pretty much pivot and be like, oh, that was too hard. Let me give them something easier. When they're playing back those lines to me by ear, are they not developing left hand skills and right hand school skills, rhythm, intonation, sound pro and projection? Are they or are they not developing those skills? They are. Without a doubt, they are. At a certain point, we're going to start talking not just about failures, but about revisions. But I'm wondering, though, if you were to go out and perform, could you include in your piece, like, hey, now we're going to do a play-long thing, and we're going to present this mm -hmm. to you for three to five minutes. Could you do that as part of a concert? I'm just curious. Or right. could one do that? What do you think? You're going to come up against my perfectionist nature in terms of what is public performance. Every year I do with my eighth grade group, we do every spring an improv piece. Every spring. And I've got kids stand up and they take improvised solos. Which is hard to do because every if you've got 40 kids all standing up to take a solo. Well, well the ones who volunteer. In class, everybody. In performance, volunteers. I don't okay. force yeah. kids into So you do this, do right. So you're doing um, this, you're incorporating that. So, and I'm glad that I found a way to do that. So what I'm looking at is how to boil that down to a more throughout the year approach to an earlier grades approach, right. because I'm not really getting that until the end of the third year. And we can talk about revision processes again, like how do I battle the time to get that in? I would want to know that I would present a very successful demonstration of skill. Yeah. But based on like what, what you saw in the classroom today, a couple of days ago when I was working with the kids, well, I'll tell you what I experienced yep. when I worked with each group, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, and I started to do a call and response with them. And for anybody that's listening, it's, I've got a loop going on. It's like my play along videos on YouTube. If you want to ever check them out, you can check them out. But I'll do this live with a group of students and I can pretty quickly figure out, are they playing it back to me or yep. not? Right. And so if they're not doing it, then I'm going to make it easier. I might even play just one note, like da, 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 da you play it back, right? And right. I'll tell them the note. I'll yeah. make it yeah. as easy as necessary so that literally every kid can do it, right? And then, so if they're not getting it, I'll make it easier. And then I'll gradually make it trickier. And by the end of the class, I felt like I had a good sense about what they could do, what they couldn't do. Now, I right. might have still pushed them sometimes. Makes You're sense? making me think right now. So one of my revisions, which is not necessarily a revision towards creativity per se, just a revision towards better use of my curriculum and better pedagogy and reconsidering what really is a concert. So I've been in the process of reconsidering what qualifies as repertoire. Do I have to have three composed pieces? Or maybe, and I did this year and I thought it was tremendous. I'm so glad I did it. I have two prepared pieces and two prepared repertoire pieces and several, like several, short unison pieces, which are skills demonstrations. Great, I love So this. it gave me a little more comfort in terms of devoting the time that I think the underlying skills need. Where sometimes repertoire, 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 repertoire robs you of that time just the same as anything right. else can. And it also robs you sometimes of equity across your classroom yeah. versus you spend all this time on the violin part, but how about your poor violas right. and bass players? Well, that's right? one of the things I noticed about your composition of, that your kids played for me today is that everybody was playing the unison melodies, so they're mm -hmm. all working out on their instruments. I love that.
And that's a development I've made over the years. Yeah. I, do, I don't hand out a piece of repertoire that doesn't have unison worksheets. And I prepare yeah. unison worksheets. So my bass players learn the I first violin that. parts. My violas learn the first yeah. violin parts. My first violins learn the bass parts. And we learn everything before we go to put together repertoires. And it keeps everybody engaged all the time. So I don't yeah. have engagement issues with my low strings or mid strings. Nobody's right. ever waiting and yeah. everyone's developing skills. And then it has the added benefit that when we are putting it together, everyone really knows each other's parts. <laughs> so you get better listening because kids know how yeah. to listen to each other because they right. know what they're listening. This is this great. Is I, mean, I love that. Teachers need mm -hmm. to know about that. If teachers want to find your stuff, do you have a website or they can just email you? Emailing me is fine. It's uh, sethgamba at yahoo.com. I get emails Perfect. Sometimes, yeah. but uh, if you Google my name or go into JW yeah. Pepper or Sheet Music Plus, your favorite right. sheet music retailer, search for Seth Gamba. You got compositions yeah. there, but I think that teachers could utilize some of these unison worksheets and this mm -hmm. kind of whole approach that you're using. I it, like that. It, I'd say it, it takes me about an hour or so per piece of music to put together that unison worksheet, but that's my score study. That's my preparation as a teacher. So I figure that those couple hours on the front end is really time well This would spent. be a value yeah. added thing though, if more teachers, if more composers that were writing for educational ensemble, mm -hmm. first of all, writing in that way, I heard Bob Phillips talk about this at Asta. He always makes sure that he writes melodies for all the instruments, but you're kind of taking that a step further. That's great, Seth Gamba at Yahoo. So I've been reconceiving what can be a concert program because right. you know what parents love to see what their kids are learning so if i can give a few of these technique melodies that right. we've all learned in unison then that gives me a vehicle to communicate with my parents and to educate the audience and there is no good reason why i couldn't do a call and response demonstration piece as part of a concert so long as i prepare it because you know we went back to my perfectionist nature i want to put kids in a situation where they will be successful but if i prepare that in class and we've done enough of it, and I yeah. know they can do it. I feel like if you were to start doing call and response mm -hmm. on a regular basis, you would start to get the hang of it. It would be yeah. really easy, you know what I mean? So I think probably if you just do it in right. class, like five minutes a day, and my recommendations for any other teachers that are listening is have some kind of backing track or metronome or groove machine mm -hmm. because we want to keep the kids together, and especially if you're doing right. syncopation. Now, when I want to get them to improvise responses or even not give them a call and get them to improvise, then there are mm -hmm. several strategies that I use. But one of them specifically that I've used in the last couple of days is to give them really clear rhythmic restrictions. Mm -hmm. So what I find a lot of times is in the jazz studies canon especially, people mm -hmm. will come in and they'll be like, let me show you this blue scale. Okay, and let me show you this swing rhythm. Let me show you this melody. Let me tell you about the chords. Okay, now use the blue scale and just play some stuff. That, in my experience, that does not work. And I see people trying to do it all the time. The reason it doesn't work is because there's missing a critical piece of scaffold. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were to say, give them a specific melodic rhythm, say here is five notes, da, bo, bo, ba, B, G minor blue scale, right? Mm -hmm. Let them yeah. play around with that for a while with Calmer Sons. But then you say, okay, I want you to use any of those notes, but it's gotta be this rhythm, da, da. Then you play. Another constraint, and the one that they can understand, it makes it so much easier to decide what to do because they have right. a framework to do it in. Another way that we did that is that I would say, okay, pick any note in the D major scale, but you're only going to play on my cue, right? It's like, you know, yeah. two, three, four, play. Now change, change. But again, the, the critical thing is telling them when to pick the note. Let me tell you what I liked about that, because I've never done it that way. Even when I work with my eighth graders on improv skills. But by eighth grade, I think they have a deeper theoretical knowledge base that I've built up. It's You don't need as much constraint. But with the younger kids especially, that was great. And here's the thing that I loved about it. Because when you say, okay, now make something up, it's par paralyzing. Like right. one, of, one of the most common responses you get from kids is this paralysis of blank canvas. And it gave it such a great framework. So you have this menu of notes, which is maybe your major scale. But you've got four counts, and now you're going to another one. And That's now it. you're going to another one, and it keeps you moving, and you're not giving someone this blank canvas they get intimidated by. So I thought that was really effective. That's great. Yeah, and, then, and I think that even that could be a demonstration, in mm -hmm. my opinion. 
it's not call and response, but you can have a loop going. I like to do that with free notes as well and with these more non-tonal mm -hmm. frameworks and stuff. But if you have some kind of rhythm keeping them together, I find that it can really yeah. help you if it's a bass line, whatever. And then even if you have kids that are soloing or playing in duos or trios, it can work then too. Because let's say you've got just two kids and you say, okay, I want you to make a video in a breakout room or on Zoom mm -hmm. or at your house or whatever. But each one of you is just playing free notes, whole notes, or one's playing whole notes and one's playing half notes and keeping in time. I find yeah. that these things work tremendously well. Where were we? I lost my train of thought. You were talking about how when you give concerts, revising kind of the definition of what a concert looks like, basically. It's like, hey, parents, let us show you what we were working on. You know, you can pretend that your seventh graders are professional musicians, but, but, but they're not. And you can pretend that your parents are sophisticated concert goers who know what an orchestra is supposed to look and sound like, but, but they're not. I do a, a program with the Atlanta Symphony every year. Where I take about between two and 300 people to the Atlanta Symphony every wow. year. And it's kids and parents. They have to bring their parents. And of those two to 300 people I bring every year, you know, the parents, there is a large portion of my parents who that's their first time going to see a professional symphony wow. orchestra. So educating my audience is a critical part of what I do. So yeah. not only developing my skills, but in terms of building community support. And plus it gives me a better technical foundation because I get more time to do the unison studies that I used to be thinking I don't have enough time. I got to work on this repertoire, so we're skipping some skill or not developing some skill as deeply as needed. This is something of the things that came from COVID. There's not much I want to keep out of that, but having to make up lost ground and finding what I let go of and really having to backfill a lot of technical stuff. And it just struck me. My first sixth grade concert, we play hot cross buns in unison. And that's your first sixth grade concert. They've been playing their instrument like eight weeks. Right. So what, what do you got? I mean, you got right. Mary Had a Little Lamb, you got Hot Cross Bones right. in unison. Why can't more advanced stuff also be presented as skill studies in unison and have that be something you can present? I think so. it's great. I love it. I challenge anybody to tell us a reason why that can't happen. I think teachers <laughs> listening. Well, let me ask you this, if you don't mind. Okay. You put down here, what are the challenges we face in doing creative music at, in other words, in kids to go beyond just playing the classical dots. And you said hitting skills targets is a challenge faced in teaching your young music students to be creative. Why, why mm -hmm. is hitting skills targets a challenge? Why, well, why is that? The classical symphony orchestra approach is very repertoire centric in terms of your rhythmic alignment. You got to have just that precision in your rhythmic alignment in terms of tuning your chords or tuning your unison lines. It just has to be that precise. Well, well, tuning wait, let me, your unison lines, Let me push right? back on okay. both of those, though, yeah. because, again, you can be honest, but yeah. I just worked with your sixth graders and seventh graders and eighth graders, and my takeaway from that was the kids worked on a lot of rhythm, and they also, mm -hmm. to some degree, worked on intonation. In uh, all the things right. we did, I mean, some of it was play along, some of it was improv-based. Let's take the other I'm side of curious. that is, it's also the reading. It's the reading. The reading. I'm a reading teacher. I am a language and reading teacher. Some years ago, I completed my teacher certification in reading. So I'm certified in music and reading, and I became such a better music teacher by getting certified to teach reading. So what do you mean and to certified to teach reading? If I got sick of teaching orchestra, I could go get a job as a reading teacher. Teaching yeah. kids to, to read language. They're talking like the mechanics of reading because there are literacy issues. We got kids yeah, who can't sure. read. We want to turn this back to music. Teaching how to read English versus teaching how to read standard music notation. In many, many ways, they're the same thing. And what I hear you saying yeah. also is that you stand for that there's value in teaching kids to read music. Absolutely. I teach kids how to read music way better than I did before I... Yeah, got certified got to be a reading right. teacher. But isn't it also valuable to learn music by ear? Yes. But we get back to this classical model, right? Where I've got my repertoire in it. They have 
got to be able to read. And the, it, the struggle is real, man. I'm going to tell you, there's tremendous time pressure on that. Particularly, they get more advanced. The reading gets more complicated. Intervals, rhythms. There's a lot to do. Okay, feel free to shoot me down yeah. on this. I feel like if I remember back to being in high school orchestra, yeah. it'd be like, okay, we're running this new piece. Okay, and right. we just keep playing the piece until the concert happens, right? <laughs> But I feel like a lot of times people could have learned like the basic mechanics of reading the piece in other ways. For example, let's listen to a recording and follow along with your music while you listen to the recording. Mm -hmm. For example, let's play with an actual metronome. Let's do unison work. Yeah. I would imagine that this would make kids learn stuff faster. And also I would imagine that if you took exercises out of that, of that repertoire that involved them reading, but then had them play other stuff, Mm -hmm. that was slightly by ear or, or whatever, and then had them come back in the reading that it might reinforce. I don't know. What do you think, though? It, it, it's, a, it, it's all mutually reinforcing, gotcha. right? If you're not listening, you're not playing into it. If you're not reading, then you're not being able to accomplish more complicated repertoire. Now, I've got to do a complete music curriculum in you know, a 50-minute daily class period, 40 of which is usable. Can you do everything? You know, do you do something focused in depth to my level of perfectionism. And I'm not trying to argue against being creative in the music classroom, because boy, I'm trying. I'm even working on it, and I've had some success. I mean, I've been having some successes again lately. I had not considered a call and response section on a concert, and there's no reason I couldn't do that. And one of the things that gives you time in your classroom is making time on your concert. That was a breakthrough for me in terms of teaching improvisation. Because in other words, because if, you, I, if you're going to put it on the concert, then you have to justify doing it in the class. I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. and if you're putting it on the concert, that means you're taking something else out. So it gives you time. I right. get to teach yeah. improvisation because I have a piece on my concert that's an improvising piece. But there are so things that you do. cars out the time in my curriculum. But there are things you do in your classroom every day in 30 seconds and two minutes mm. and five minutes. Right? Yeah. And drills that, and you've got some great drills. I was really inspired by seeing some of the things you had them do with breathing, with playing their long bows and mm. tuning their instruments. I mean, you did that in two minutes, which was inspiring, right? So why not do the same thing with call and response? or improvisation. Right. Could you do that in three or four minutes? These are the kinds of things I've been talking about with yeah. Martin. And this is the idea of call and echo where I can verify a skill. Like, so, so let's say my sixth graders, we were working on G and F sharp, right? Your first two notes, you, mm -hmm. got, you got a G and an F sharp. Can you place and lower your finger, right? And I was getting ready to have them start making up stuff and I gave a call, G, F, G, F, and I went and I saw the kid going G, and I like had her finger backwards, like, oh no, all right. So the kid don't know the difference between G and F sharp. We're not ready to improvise with that yet because we don't have knowledge. We don't have sure. understanding. Right. You can't create with something you don't know. Uh, so wait, like, we should so, say that again. Because I say that all the time. Yeah. I'm so glad to hear you say this. So if you can hold on to your thought, if you don't yeah. mind. But this to me is worth really mm -hmm. going into. So I read this book by Daniel Kahneman. It's fast thinking, slow thinking. But basically the idea is when we have two modes of thinking. Slow thinking is when we're learning something, right? And fast thinking is either we're already an expert at it or it's mm -hmm. an instinctual, it's part of our animal instinct. So if we see a predator, we run instantly. But otherwise, if you try to play your violin left-handed, <laughs> that's slow thinking, right? Yeah. If you try to play a game of chess and you haven't played 200 games, it's, it's mm -hmm. slow thinking. I totally agree with what you said. And I think this is one of the big mistakes that I was talking about earlier with jazz studies. Mm -hmm. Jazz studies, they come in and they say, let me show you this blue scale. They say, okay, now improvise. But they don't know the blue scale yet. It's different to just play a couple things and then be like, you know. And that's the issue with why so many classical musicians try to improvise over chord prog progressions. And they can't do it because they don't know the chord progressions deeply right. enough. But anyway, so I totally agree. When If we're going to teach improvisation, it's got to be within a realm that the kids, they already have understanding. Which is why right. I like to do non-tonal improvisation. Totally chromatic free mm -hmm. improvisation. When we were doing free notes in the class. And I can go back to that thought in the G to the F sharp, right? Because yeah. I had it already. We were going to do some call and echo. And we were going to turn it into call and response. And I was still going to be able to evaluate their G to F sharp. But I had some number of kids didn't even know the difference between G and F sharp. It's like, all right, let's put this on hold. So I put it on hold a little bit. And then what I'm finding out is really your skills are here, but your improvising is here, right? So these things kind of go in steps and I'm finding a lot more success with it. Right, so if I'm step one skill, step two skill, step three skill, 
by the time I'm on step three skill, I'm ready to have kids start improvising successfully on step one skill. By the time I'm on step four skill, by then they own step two skill gotcha. enough that I'm ready to start having them improvise on That's step great. two skill. And that has been really valuable. That has to be kind of codified for people, I think. Right? Yeah, and this is my new exploration into yeah. number one, making it manageable. So how can I do a creative exercise and have it two minutes of my class time? So if I can yeah. come to that like several times a week, two, three minutes of yeah. class time, right. uh, on top of everything else that needs two or three minutes of class time, right. and have it be something that's integrated into a student's musical experience, right? That's what I'm trying to get to. And it still reinforces our skill develop in a way that I can evaluate my students. And it can also give them depth of understanding because the thing about you can't create with something you don't know but if you can create with something, then you're going to know it so much better from having right. created it. Because with... you're discovering problems, and then you're coming up with your own solution to those mm. problems. You're finding your own problems, and you're choosing problems, and you're finding solutions to them versus an etude book where somebody else is giving you a problem. Yeah. I would love to move my students in that direction because you know, that's in my personality. And maybe I don't know what's intrinsic versus what's learned. When I face a problem, I create to solve it. So when I was first learning to play the blues, I didn't get into what did I do? I started writing blues tunes. Some of them weren't so good, but I think I got a few. I did like I had my bands would have made That's it as great. part of the set list, but that helped me to understand the blues. So what got me to quick thinking was, pieces, so. was creating yeah, blues slowly, tunes. Yeah, slowly, like right? writing, writing tunes. Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. And so I'd like to move my students toward that because you deepen your understanding by creating with the things you know. It, okay, so I'm sure you'll have an opinion about this, but... Why don't more orchestra teachers give their students homework and make them turn in assignments? Different people are going to have different experiences. I'll speak to my experience. That if you don't do it in class, it doesn't get done, period, forget. I don't like to give homework assignments because then I have to grade them. You know, the, there's, there's, yeah, just, there's just a... I was a, just a curious. Yeah, yeah, involved, absolutely. Because I did give, and again, maybe this is my own perfectionist nature, right? Uh -huh. I did this video thing where I had everybody record their eight measure phrase. And then for me, the value to my student is in my feedback. Yeah. By the time I gave what I thought was valuable feedback, right. the time investment was inhuman. But I still want to pin right. you down on this answer though. So what we're talking about is finding a routine, yes. adding to your routine with your in your classroom where you get your kids all in a big group to be creative every day. You said, yeah, you think you can do it with call and echo and call and response. And so I want to give feedback on the call and response okay. part because I think that it's going to be critical to have that scaffolding. You're right. I agree with what you said. Mm -hmm. I also think that there has to be really a lot of specificity that we give them when it comes right. to the response, which is why I would say in addition to call and response, I think it's important to not even have a call and just mm -hmm. to have parameters that they improvise within. And here's right. how I'm going to suggest okay. to do it. And I'm going to share it with everybody. If we give the kids a groove and then if we give them rhythmic parameters but allow them to choose free notes then it can either be chromatic or within a major scale it can be fully chromatic or within a major if we say here's the groove and here's your parameters you're going to play this rhythm da mm -hmm. da and i want you to do that rhythm but make up your own notes yeah. or you're just going to move periodically change the bow change your note now, you can play half notes and whole notes, or you can play half notes, whole notes, and rests. You can layer those things in, and after you start to give them these types of very constrained exercises around improvisational choices, then before you know it, they're going to have a lot of freedom. They're going to feel free. They're going to feel warm. They're not going to have a blank slate, and you can be like, okay, right. now you can play whatever you want, and they're going to go crazy. Right? I'm so excited about trying to implement this because what I was getting at with the concerto example, I have tried to have students improvise around their problem spot and without fail, they freeze. I have yet to successfully teach a kid how to practice with improvisation. And now I think I have a way into it. I'm excited about that based on what you are saying right now. Yeah, even with the practicing, that's interesting that you said that because actually the first day that I worked with your students, I had these four buckets that I used. One was feelings. And I yeah. do this thing oh, called yeah. free association. And I said, okay, play angry. And all the kids were playing. Mm -hmm. And I had to stop them. I said, now play sad. Then they all played. Mm -hmm. And I did confused. All those kids were playing, emphatically playing. Every one of your kids was improvising, 
based on just that prompt. They were going all across the neck. They were doing all kinds mm -hmm. of things. Then I said long bows. Then I said bouncing bows. Then I said pizzicato. Mm -hmm. So in that space, that's practicing a technique. The way I warmed them up was by doing that free association exercise. Right. They were like game. So yeah. there wasn't any like paralysis. Right. But another way to do it is to have really, really binary choices. Mm -hmm. It's like play this note or play that note and play right. it at this time. And so I think that also if you give them really clear restraints, you say, okay, I just want you to shift up and down on this string, but you can either slide slow or fast. That's it. Go. That will work. And then if you say, yeah. now, if you were going slow, then go fast. Right. Now I want you to take some period where you go slow and then some period where you go fast. Then they're going to be sliding. You know, you can do a similar well, thing. With it, well, I mean, gosh, even just that is a way into expressive vibrato. Ultimately. And I think it'd be the same thing with the trills. You know, it could yeah. be like pick two fingers, do a trill with those two fingers. Yeah. Then pick two other fingers and do a trill. Right. But if you give them specific place when to do it, like yeah. I want you to do a trill when I count you in, but you have to decide now, second and third, or third and fourth, or fourth or first yeah. and second. One, two, three, trill. Blah, 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 blah. Off. Next, pick your two fingers. One, yeah. two, three, trill. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Does that resonate with you oh, or not? It, it does. And again, that's a degree of creativity. But I've discovered is I need to do first is I make sure everybody can do this trail. Once I know they can all do that, we can go back and now you pick your own and introduce a degree of creative freedom. I agree with that to yeah. some degree, but I will also say yeah. that around that, that I think that there are sometimes exceptions to that because it also reminds me that there's a lot of times that people have said, Kids need to know their foundation before they can improvise, before they can be creative. And mm -hmm. I don't agree with that either, because I think if you give like right. a kid who just picked up the instrument some of those fun, they actually can just play well, with the instrument if it's not about doing it right. I got this kid. She's a year and a half behind the whole rest of the class, but she's got a great attitude. She's coming in for extra practice every day. She joined my class a week and a half ago. But she was just having fun making some of these same noises. Right. She, she was having a blast, and she was the most confident I've heard on her instrument. And, you know, there's value. I saw a lot of value in that. So they might not yeah. be able to do a perfect trill, but we could say, hey, we've never done trills at all. Mm -hmm. But just imagine that you can trill third and fourth, second and third, first and second, yeah. first third, first fourth, right. second and fourth, and just try it. Would there be value in that? Wouldn't that yes. help them get more excited about actually learning yeah. the how to do the proper trills or whatever? I first get to trills when I'm first starting to teach slurs. So your first slur is a trill. So let's say I, I run them through each finger to each finger, at least adjacent finger. We do that. After 10 minutes, we probably are far enough ahead to let them do something creative with a trill. But I'm asking you know, yeah. something else, though. I'm saying, okay. I'm actually saying, wouldn't it be possible for them not even have to do that to do something creative with the trill? Like, you can't be creative with the F sharp major scale before you know it. But with the trill, arguably right. you could because it's intuitive to a degree. And especially if you're not trying to play correct notes. So there's a famous study that if you give a kid a toy that does seven different things and you say, here's this toy, it does these two things. And you give it to the kid, the kid will play with the toy and do those two things. If you give that kid the toy and say, hey, here's a toy, that kid is going to discover all seven things and maybe even something else. That's what I'm saying. But yeah. that would not apply right. to the F-sharp major scale, though. <laughs> right? That's right. why I think there's some difference there. Right. Because a lot of teachers will say, well, people need to learn how to play the instrument first before mm -hmm. they can get creative. But in the case of trills, it's not true. And I would argue also in the case of string crossings, if you said, look, what I want you to do is each note that you play, I want it to be on a different string than the one before. And mm -hmm. you're gonna play on my cue, ready? Play, off, ready? Again, play, off. They're gonna improvise and they're gonna be crossing strings. Yeah. And that can be totally intuitive. We didn't really get down my list very far back. Oh, the first thing, but one of the, one of the next thing, one of the things somewhere on that list okay. is where as the director, are you willing to give up control? And I tell you what, as a classroom teacher, that step of being willing to give up control is a big step. I don't really have to control every single part of what they do. Right. Now, maybe at least not all the time. Sometimes you get to the corral section in your piece right. and you got to get that corral right. section sounding right. good. But you know, I mean, as part of your warm up, I don't need to control everything. It's one you of the know? things I loved about your classroom was every day when I got there, the kids would come in before you even started. They were all practicing and playing playing. It's amazing. You've incorporated that. You gave up control of that. Well, you probably control it in the sense that you said you should be practicing <laughs> and tuning, but then they do it, but you don't micromanage them. They're mm. doing it. 
that's the idea, you know, and see so your string crossing example. If my technical goal is string crossing, then do I really need to control what note they play? If my technical goal is a rhythm, do I still really need to control what note they play? Uh -huh. Really? If my technical goal is tuning, right? Do I really need to control what rhythm they play then? Not necessarily. And actually going back you know, to your point about reading, because I'm mm -hmm. sure you probably teach a lot of rhythmic reading. I have a whole book. I've got a book. You can buy so what it. If rhythmic you would, reading. Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. So yeah. Check out Seth Rhythmic book, Rhythmic J.W. Pepper. Yeah. So why right, anyway. not incorporate improvisation with the rhythmic reading? Why mm -hmm. not say like, okay, you know, we're going to do this rhythmic reading. Let's say the rhythm exercise is this. Let's say that's the rhythmic reading exercise. Okay. But we're going to say, okay, for this entire exercise, you're going to play either open A or open D on every single note. Mm -hmm. You get to choose when, which is when. You can never do it the same way. Mm -hmm. da, da, ooh, ooh. Close enough. That's a D. <laughs> D, D, A, D, D, A, 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 D, D, A, D, 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 A, A, D, D, A. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's do it again. You got to do it something different with it this time. Mm -hmm. Can well, you take I, them through your you rhythmic, rhythmic reading exercises, but have them improvised with two notes or three notes or... You, 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 that would, that would be a level of ownership to be able to do that right. for sure and they'd be learning yeah. to read rhythm but they'd be well, making an improvisation with the notes that's a great idea you know and i'm always looking for ways to, to use this rhythm thing i use this rhythm thing i wrote all the time because i wrote it because I needed i'd like it. to i'd like to get a copy of that i i, I wrote it because i needed it and it's a, it's a projector thing it's not books it goes up on the board and it's non-pitched because I right. want to be able to right. use it with any combination of instruments. Band right. teachers use it. Right. Yeah, elementary school recorder teachers use it. And, and I keep going back. Yeah, I'll, I'll go through a set of things and I'll get to a certain level. And then I go back and do it in a more complicated way. And then I go back, right. keep going back and adding that's another layer circle. on top nice. of it. Yeah. That That's a great layer. I got I got one more way. I got one more all way of to these, use it. That's so great all idea. these suggestions that I'm making, are they all have something in common. And I probably am not articulating it very well, but there's always a level of specificity and constraint. I guess maybe I'm not describing it well, but that that it allows for a student to improvise, but also within a constraint. But it's not too hard for them, right? So yeah, well, it seems but, like but, we're getting to something with yeah, that. getting past the blank page syndrome is that's always a huge right. hurdle, yeah. right? So if they have a rhythm and that they got to yeah. read, there's no blank page issue, right? Exactly. And if you make it do, you know, but if you but I think what might be weird, for example, is if you had that same rhythmic thing and you said, okay, so just play the, and this is what I think a lot of people would do, mm -hmm. and I think where they would make a mistake. They would say, read these rhythms, but make up the notes. It's not specific too, enough. It's too much. It's too, it's too much. much. But if you said, well, each bar pick a different note. You know, if it was right. like just, you know. Hey, guys, you, you can, can even constrain it this. to the to root fifth. You could constrain right. it to arpeggio. You, you, right. If you just yes. can't handle the chaos of any note, right, right. you could at least constrain it to consonant notes. Right? And within yeah. something that they understand. Yeah. yeah. That they don't have to think too hard about. Yeah. Yeah. But so, uh, yeah, that's good. So we're getting somewhere. Well, yeah. this has been great. Um, I feel like we should wrap it up, but I mean, okay. we talked about Bloom's taxonomy start and you gave a lot on this. Um, really, I just want to give folks a way to, uh, first of all, I want to say thanks again for bringing me down uh, to work with your, your classroom and just how much I respect you for the ma massive amount of work that you do with your students. You have them playing all the time. You care so much about them. You work like crazy. It's, totally an inspiration to me um yeah so thank you and kudos and again so people can find your stuff jw pepper seth gamba period you know uh, and they can email you seth gamba at yahoo is there anything else you want people to know about everything is an art <laughs> you know yeah I, I i teach music i teach young musicians i do not train professional musicians and that, that's something that i have, have had to become very clear with and but, so my, my ultimate goal really, and I try not to lose sight of this, is that ultimately anything you do is an art hmm. if you approach it artistically. Like teaching, you mean? Like, like teaching, like music, like math, hmm. like science, like history. Yeah, I anything you do is an art hmm. if you approach it as an artist. If you approach it with a creative mindset.
And mm -hmm. if you approach it as something that's always in development, but you, you never get there. It's always a journey. Why do you and think so, so many classical teachers uh, struggle with, um, aside from this, I mean, because mm -hmm. you're a jazz musician as well as a mm -hmm. classical musician, you're a composer, you're a creative musician. Why do you think it's hard for a lot of other classroom orchestra teachers to deal with these issues? Aside from the things that you've shared yeah. that were hard for you. Um, yeah, without, without stretching this too much longer, is it, it's outside the realm of experience. Right. The, the music classroom is frequently an expressive space, but it's not all that often a creative space. That degree of freedom, we've been talking about where are the degrees of constraint, but we're also putting on that where are the degrees of freedom. And I, most teachers don't teach that way. My teachers didn't teach that they way. They just don't, they haven't had that experience. They, so, so, I mean, you have, it, it's cycles of what is someone's experience. Right. Um, oh, that's right. You have a YouTube channel too, right? I, I have a YouTube channel. It's just my name. Seth, Seth Gamba. Look, okay. look up Seth Gamba yeah, on check YouTube. Out the YouTube. Lo lots of resources. Lots of, I'm a bass player. Lots of bass stuff. I got okay. lots of bass videos that I started developing yeah. in concert with like concert conference presentations, teaching teachers how to teach bass right. better. Tons of bass resources. Right. 